Hi, I'm Sheila Kuehl. Welcome to another edition of Get Used To It, a discussion show about issues that are important to the lesbian and gay community. Um, we are on cable once a month, and this week I'm uh, really happy to tell you that our topic has to do with homophobia, or I should say lesbianophobia, I guess, in the women's movement, uh, feminism, lesbianism, and all kinds of wonderful issues. And I have three wonderful guests. Uh, I'd like to introduce you. First, Jean Conger, who is uh, executive director of the Los Angeles Women's Foundation and was national secretary and on the national board of NOW uh, and was special assistant, uh, executive assistant, sorry, to the president of NOW during the ERA ratification campaign. Uh, next to her, Abby Jane Liebman, who is one of the managing directors of the California Women's Law Center and also a board member of the Women Lawyers Association of Los Angeles. And next to her and to my left, but not very far to my left, as we know, <laughs> it's really hard to be very far to my left, uh, is Jenny Fote, who is the executive director of Caring for Babies with AIDS. And as you know, I think at one point, Jenny was president of California Now and was also active for years in National Now. Uh, we added up our years in the women's movement uh, just before we started this show and discovered that it's uh, almost 75 years collectively. We won't tell you how many each one has. But um, Jean, I want to start with you. This is, this is a topic that's getting some attention this year, I think, because so many more lesbians are out mm -hmm. and talking about uh, being lesbians but wanting to work and be identified as feminists and be in the women's movement. Mm -hmm. Do you think there is or has been homophobia in the women's movement? And how did it manifest itself? Well, I think one of the things that I like to do is sort of distinguish between or discriminate between uh, homophobia and heterosexism. And I, I look at them as two different things. Uh, homophobia, the word phobia having its base in fear, I think is, is a real, almost a conscious fear maybe a little subconscious, but mostly conscious. Whereas heterosexism, I think, is kind of an insensitivity, uh, kind of an assumption that people have that, well, everybody is like me, uh, straight, as it is, uh, is like the majority, unless they tell them otherwise. So how would that manifest itself differently in terms of, you know, you and I go to a, uh, to a meeting mm -hmm. of the Women's Movement Incorporated. Mm -hmm. um, why, w why would it be different? Okay, I think where it would be different would be the heterosexist part would be the fact that uh, they would assume that we were straight, that we were not lesbian, that we were just just like, every, just normal like everyone people. else, just like normal people, right. uh, unless unless we said something. Uh -huh. Then I think the homophobia would come in if we said something, depending on people's reactions. And I think if someone's reaction was fear or or uh, discomfort, even discomfort, I think would be. Um, evidence of homophobia, whereas I think heterosexism would be more the discounting of, of anything that wasn't like them. Well, but Abby, let me ask you, when, mm. when people talk about the women's movement, they're not necessarily talking about, you know, a meeting that you and I go to or mm. some local whatever. Um, do you see it as different in terms of sort of this being a, a national homophobia or heterosexism or just, you know, the way friends react? Well, the, the easy answer is probably that women are people too, and so women carry all of the same isms that the rest of the world did. And what, what may be more compelling around this discussion is that perhaps there was a presumption that because it was not only a movement about women, that it was meant to be inclusive of all women, especially perhaps lesbians, because they were such a part of the leadership, that this may have been a place where lesbians felt safe, and they thought that this was a place where they would be accepted too, and that we we didn't we women didn't also have a movement around gay rights or around the notion of embracing people for who they are. So we came in with all of those isms as well, and didn't start from a place of having in the gay movement first, and then of course, oh, everybody was welcome, everything's wonderful, and there are all kinds of issues around race and. I would say around sexual orientation as well, that surfaced in the women's movement because we also embraced what the majority culture did. It's an interesting point about expecting to be safe. And I, let me ask you, Jen, um, early on in the women's movement, was that, did it feel as though, of course, I don't know whether, you know, you, Jean, or Jen, or, me, or 
even me, whether we were out to ourselves, uh, <laughs> you know, in those years. That's a question that we haven't even mm -hmm. talked about. Mm -hmm. But early on, did it seem like this was a place where lesbians thought they would be safe? And then there was a disappointment, sort of like a, a rejection from people you really thought it was going to be okay with of all the people so. in the world? I think the answer is a yes and a no to that, because I think there were certain parameters and lines that, that you didn't cross. Um, certainly, I believe that lesbians felt very comfortable in the women's movement as long as the issues that they were speaking for were uh, pertaining to lesbian issues or as long as they were not uh, trying to take a leadership role in areas which were very public leadership roles. And I think this year, I mean, we can look at the National Organization for Women and this year they have, you know, uh, I guess it was actually last year, elected their first woman who may or may not, at whichever <laughs> point in her life, be or be not a, a choice. Lesbian. She's a pro-choice yes. kind, of pro yeah, yeah. kind of person. Uh -huh. And it's the first time that that has ever been a public. Now, whether someone is before that has, you know, been a lesbian in private life, it certainly has not been an out lesbian. And I think that was real clear throughout, not only now, but through uh, all other, you know, sometimes those of us who are now think that now was the only uh, women's movement. It certainly was the largest uh, women's movement. But I think that all, if you look back through the early organizing days um, where, where women were um, not accepted if they were out lesbians in certain parts of the country, and then in other parts of the country they were, but certainly the leadership roles were reserved for those who were the either not out lesbians or who were uh, uh, closet cases. Now reserved by, by who? I mean, how did it manifest itself that that happened? I think it was more a feeling of, of it was never out <clears throat> said out loud as far as in my presence, but it was always you knew that who you were is something that could damage the image of what the women's yeah. movement was. It was, it was said out loud to me, Ginny. I'm going uh, to bring that in. Because, yes, too. because um, at, after, in 1982, after the ERA campaign, um, I was still working for now. And I left and moved out here. And a num I'd been working all across the country. So a number of people had been urging me to run for pres the presidency of now at that point. And speaking with some people who were lesbians, who were very powerful in the women's movement, here in Los Angeles, and they said, uh, I don't think so. Oh, yes, you're perfectly qualified. Oh, yes, you'd be fine, but you're a lesbian. And you need to think about that. So what did they mean by that? They meant What they meant was you shouldn't the, run or you'd never get elected? I should not elected. run. No. What they meant was I should not run because I would be damaging now yeah. by being a visible person who was a lesbian. See, I think there's, some, there's something that's very interesting about this in the context of even of the larger culture and some things that we see now, but the, the notion that whoever you are when you are the outside, when you are the other, is that you are an ambassador for all the others that are like you. And therefore, the leadership of now, I think, was looked to to be reflective of all women, or that this is who the movement was about. And if the leadership was about lesbians, then was the movement about lesbians, and of course, knowing that that is probably the worst thing you could probably call anybody in our culture because that's like how you damn anything. You try to like marginalize it as much as you can, and that would be being a lesbian because it's so So hated. it was really a threat to the movement in a sense, and even lesbians, what I heard from you, Jean, mm -hmm. is that even lesbians felt that the movement itself was so right. fragile at that point, and even right. now, exactly. maybe. But it's, I don't think the fragile is the word for it. I think it, if you look at the evolution of the women's movement, the women's movement started in the street, and although, you know, many of us know that burning of the bras was really a myth. It did start as a street movement. It started where no one would uh, would ask you to go to any kind of, of a political function or anything like that. And the movement evolved and became mainstream. It went from a street movement into a mainstream movement. It went from having radical uh, uh, separatists and radical uh, straight separatists mm -hmm. uh, running the movement to having Betty Ford as a spokesperson. So the movement evolved. And when that evolution happened, I think that it became more oppressive to lesbians yeah. during mm -hmm. that evolution period, because now we wouldn't play in Peoria. But the mm -hmm. statement of purpose of now, from 1966 on, was to bring women 
and men in equal partnership into the mainstream. Uh -huh. So, I mean, that was right in the statement of purpose. So I think that was very clear. There was a real desire to integrate, to integrate into the mainstream of society well, you know, and lesbians. That's always the problem there. with a movement. We were talking about it when we did a show here about the election, mm -hmm. about sort of how you do your own organizing, mm -hmm. how you need to validate yourself, have pride. You know, we were talking about this earlier, look a certain way so that everybody would know you're mm -hmm. out. Your, your clothes say mm -hmm. you're out. You know, we mm -hmm. don't have little L buttons to wear. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we're going to be, we're going to have an identity, right? And then the ambassador notion, even from the lesbian and gay community, mm -hmm. which is, are you an acceptable, I mean, we face it now, are you an acceptable kind of queer? Mm -hmm. um, people say, oh, don't send anybody from Queer Nation because they'll make the wrong impression. Mm -hmm. And they that also could be say exactly the right impression. But they do, but they also say they do, yeah. it, to, they do it to us, too. I right. mean, they also say that you don't look gay enough. Mm -hmm. You know, somehow you're trying to pass mm -hmm. rather than saying, I'm being who I am. Mm -hmm. You know, this is who I am. Uh, this but, is how I'm comfortable. But this also happens even, say, with, with women who are straight women that are involved in the women's movement, is whether or not you have, you earn the right to say that you're really a radical, or what does a radical look like? And, right. and that, you know, I don't dress the way, you know, that's like, I'm not radical right. chic in the sense of, you know, mm -hmm. that, you know, I wear makeup, and I wear earrings, and I'm just, and you know, I don't look like a woman who's wearing, you know, or my hair's not, you know, all natural, and, and that was, there was an image, there was a stereotype image, but we also helped to, Per, to sort of perpetuate that image of this is what a woman who is a radical feminist looks like. Mm -hmm. And then that became a pejorative term. And we all either wanted to move away from the label or what I would prefer to do is to say, no, this is what a radical feminist looks like. Mm -hmm. And that's part of this whole, the whole image making. The PC, the whole PC right. business. Well, I think sure, there was if, you didn't have your, if you didn't have your blue jeans and yeah. your Birkenstocks, that's you it. weren't that's politically right. correct. But I think there was a confusion at the beginning about what it was to be a feminist, which was to be a not what we had been in the past. Mm -hmm. Okay, it was like a, all we knew to do at the beginning was to reject something. Now yes. for lesbians who were already rejected mm -hmm. and separate, mm -hmm. we had an identity. We had a look or whatever. For the, the next group who were wanting to be feminist and not separatist yet, really, mm -hmm. I think there was a confusion about how to do that among straight women and lesbians. Because mm -hmm. it looked like we had to reject male things, you know, I male. Think there's another element there though too and that is that there were women who were married who had families who had children who came out in the women's movement now some of them may have felt all of their lives that they were lesbians um, some of them didn't and some of them went back to being straight again I mean I don't know I, I think lesbian is self-defined quite frankly so I, mm -hmm. I, I there's no litmus test for it but I think that added a, a very confusing element to people as to quote, who are the real lesbians? Will the real lesbians stand up? I mean, there were people who were saying, I'm a political lesbian, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. And there was a lot of, a lot of straight baiting going on, too, that, that women who slept with men were, you know, sleeping this is the only the moment enemy. that they yeah. were sleeping, sleeping with, with the, the enemy. enemy. We right. were sleeping with the enemy, mm -hmm. you know, all of that kind of thing. So it, it, was, it, it was a very exciting time, a very heady time, but it was also, I think, a very confusing time for a lot of people. And I think, I think another point that Jean's just making is, is I think one of the important things was that the lesbians in the movement were, were looking for equality in a different way mm -hmm. than the heterosexual women were looking for equality. Their equality uh, their first thought for equality was equality within their structure of their home life. We were not looking for that quality within the structure of our home life. We were looking for more of a global uh, equality. And, and I think that, that sometimes that put us at cross purposes. And I think it caused some of the problems within the movement when the movement was accused of not taking on issues like child care uh, in strong enough ways or taking on issues like, uh, as domestic violence in strong enough and early enough within the movement. And, I th and what happened with that it was, of course, because there were too many lesbians in the movement, they didn't care about mm -hmm. child care. Mm -hmm. right. But the well, other uh -huh. thing is that when, uh -huh. when women... You I mean that was the mythology? Excuse me, yeah. I just want to clarify. Yeah. That was it was mythology. really the sort of the more middle class people were interested in the workplace mm -hmm. equality that, mm -hmm. that weren't valuing the family, but you're saying it worked out as a mythology that there were so many dykes in the movement who, of course, didn't care about children but because we were invisible children. as parents. Yes. Mm -hmm. right, but it's only also, recently we've become all these parents. <laughs> <laughs> but also there was, I mean, part of this mythology too was the fact that now didn't care about child care because very early on it did. It did, clearly did not make this the focal point of the movement. 
And then also we have to go back to Ginny's point about whether or not now was the focal point of the movement or whether sure. it was just sure. one of those places where things were happening. It was one of the more visible. I, it, yeah, was one of, it was probably the strongest national. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we look at the movement, the movement is really made up of, of a lot of different groups, but this mm -hmm. was the, the most visible national group. Yeah. But the point I was trying to make is that I think all of that business about choosing to be lesbians or being political lesbians heightened the homophobia as well, okay. because you don't choose to be an African American, you don't choose to be an Asian, you don't mm -hmm. choose to be a male or choose to be a female. But if this is something you can choose, that's pretty scary to people. Right. <laughs> okay. How the time flies when you're having a good time. Really does. We'll be right back after this. <laughs> Hey, faggot, come here, I want to talk to you. Yeah, I, I don't want any trouble. You got a problem, faggot? I'm not going to fight you. Oh, yeah? Welcome back to Get Used To It. My guest, Jean Conger. Abby Liebman and Jenny Fote. Well, I don't know if they remember what we were talking about or if we remember what we were talking about. One of the things I was thinking when you were talking about what the movement was concentrating on sort of early on, it's, it felt to me as though there was a lot of concentration on the getting into the workplace, having careers, mm -hmm. uh, equality sort of in the public sphere, but I heard you say not as much concentration on the private sphere. Did that make a difference in where lesbians were or what they cared about or because maybe there was a division between the middle class lesbians who wanted jobs and the, you know, the uh, downwardly mobile dykes who were talking about other issues for women. I, to be honest with you, I don't think there, I think there was um, a difference, but I think it was more at a local level versus a national level rather than a division along, you know, sexual orientation lines. Uh, I think at the local level, there was a lot more emphasis on home and family issues, on consciousness raising. I mean, there were consciousness raising groups. At the national level, it was like, none of that belly button gazing, let's get out there and organize, you know? <laughs> let's break that class. Right, yeah. my God, yes, let's get out there and, and do that. So I think also uh, one of the things we were talking about is that the fundraising was the, the ERA, for example, was a wonderful fundraising and organizing tool. A political organizing tool, and it was. It was absolutely marvelous, and I think we were quite open about that. Uh, then other issues, I think during the end of the ERA campaign, for example, all the other issues took a back seat. Uh, even even uh, abortion rights, reproductive rights, which were still very, very hot issues, but they all took a back seat to the Equal Rights Amendment, and, and lesbian rights did also. And it was a much, it was a much safer issue. Mm -hmm. Who could argue? I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. they could argue. <laughs> Plenty of people, won. yeah. But who could argue? Who knew? Everyone we were is equal. You know, Roe v. Wade and nice, not the ERA. It was right. such a nice, mm -hmm. clean issue. It wasn't, you know, lesbian and gay rights. It wasn't anything. It wasn't killing babies. It wasn't mm -hmm. doing any of that. It was a nice, clean but, issue. But I think, it's, I think it is important to remember that at the point in time when it was first raised, it wasn't so clean. I mean, this is like a radical concept. I mean, this was a radical movement because it was not accepted. It wasn't part of the mainstream. You know, now in hindsight, a, a generation later, we think about the fact that it seems amazing in some respects. I think people who are very young think, how could that possibly be? It must have been, we must have screwed it up somehow. Right. I mean, how could they not have passed this? And when you think about how absorbing that ERA campaign was and how much right. energy had to go into it and how difficult it was, there is in some ways a good explanation as to why it was that these other issues began to become peripheral because A, we had to do this and B, we couldn't even get this. But you know, it was interesting, that's when I saw a lot of lesbians either being forced out or dropping out of this national thing saying, what's the ERA got to do with us? This is a middle class women's issue. I mean, I think the exactly. first thing I ever read that Tori Osborne wrote was about why dykes should care about the ERA. I mean, it was it was an to article in, when pieces, she was working for you right, in San Francisco, right. and it was because there were so many lesbians that said, "This is not our issue. Exactly. We're going to do the battered women's movement." I mean, this we care about violence against women. What is this equality stuff? What we care is about women's stuff, family stuff. So I wonder if that's also what you meant by the local level. Sort I, of I think that's I think that's probably probably true. Although, 
when I was working in my chapter at the local level, I wasn't out as a lesbian. Mm -hmm. So we were dealing with those, you know, a lot of those issues. We didn't have any lesbians in our chapter. <laughs> now, why <laughs> so we that? Remember that, yeah. <laughs> now why was that, Jean? Why was that? Uh, well, I think because it was, it was obviously not a safe place to be out. I mean, I can remember my first thought, the first meeting I ever missed, the first now meeting I ever missed was one that was on, we had a group of lesbians who came to talk about lesbian rights. I was like, lesbian rights? That, what kind of feminist issue is that? You know, mm. I had a terrible headache that night. <laughs> <laughs> but oh. in any case, uh, this and news I came to me out having been shortly <laughs> thereafter. <laughs> oh. What? This is sort of news to me. I'm thinking about the particular chapter we're thinking about. It's sort of interesting. Just it's to not, the, it's, not, it's uh, on the East Coast, mm. oh. not a chapter that you know. But in any case, I think that, I think that um, lesbians, I, I think there was a, a fear of lesbians being visible in the movement because it was something, I mean, that's what I call real, you know, that really was homophobia. The fear that lesbians would somehow um, further marginalize this, mm -hmm. this whole movement that already was somewhat marginalized. When I was a teacher, for example, this is in the early 70s, working on the ERA, married with children and so on, one of my fellow teachers just despised me because I was trying to take away her husband's job. After all, women didn't have to have jobs. You know, you mm -hmm. were taking away the jobs of men who had to support families. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really some of what was going on then. We were, as feminists, very marginalized in the early to mid 70s. It was only toward the end of the 70s that, that feminism and, and the Equal Rights Amendment even became something that looked possible. So do you think that's changed? I mean, do you think it's, two questions, I guess. Mm -hmm. Is it safer for the women's movement now to say, yeah, there are a bunch of lesbians in this movement. So what? Well, I think it is safer in some ways, but I think you have to go back just a step. When you become part of a movement, you believe that everyone in that movement wants the same thing. And once you get past understanding that that's not really true, then it's a lot easier to work within the movement. I think that that we amongst ourselves in, in the lesbian community have done some of the things that have have caused the women's movement to I think we need to take some of the blame I guess is what it is uh, a very little teeny part of the blame <laughs> but some of the blame when Jean and I or a group of my friends are together and we're together in a group uh, in which there are uh, also straight women presence present there's kind of a camaraderie mm -hmm. among us um, that we share a common thread um, that's not necessarily present in in the um, in the heterosexual women together, and it's kind of like a bond. And even if you've newly met the people who are in that group, there is kind of that bond that I don't believe exists in the heterosexual women, because heterosexual women have been far more competitive. Uh, towards each other, I think, than, than lesbian women ever I don't, well, I don't No, I don't, I don't agree with that either. I, I think it has more to do with what, what um, people bond together in oppression, okay? And there is, you, you know, you recognize each other. It's, it's if, if you are a small group in a large group of people who are different from you and who are viewed, you know, in a sense as the oppressor, you, di you tend to bond together, you recognize each other, and you, and you instinctively mm -hmm. support each other and have that kind of camaraderie. I, I, I just think, I don't know, I, 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 don't, I don't like to say, I mean, I don't take the blame for that. I really don't. I, do, yeah, I disagree with you. But even if you're the majority in the group that you're, particular group that you're in, there still is that kind of bonding that separates you from the, well, but the, I don't know if that's uh, necessarily a bad thing. Well, Abby, right. you know, and you're, yeah. you're on the Women Lawyers Board, and to my knowledge, I'm, I'm the only I'm lesbian. I actually just went off, but it's okay. I'm it the only me. lesbian that's ever been on that board, and certainly the only as one that's I ever know. been president, as far as we know, right? right? But it felt like Actually, a very comfortable group to me. Yeah. I don't know. What's, I mean, I don't Why know where you? Any. Why were you the only lesbian who was on that board, or the only lesbian who was ever? president of the board well th this raises some of those issues of whether you where you want to put your activism and if as a as a lawyer what you wanted to do was to identify with the women lawyers group or do you want to identify with the gay 
lawyers group. And there are a number of lesbian lawyers who have a much more def definitive identification with the lawyers gay lawyer, lawyers rights. for human rights. Mm -hmm. right. And um, I, this raises issues about people of color involved in the women's movement, about why it was that they weren't there. Was it that they weren't welcome? Was it that they felt a greater identification with issues of color than they did of issues of gender? And the complexity of those questions may have to be decided on an individual basis. I don't know. And um, yeah, I because think there I are more options. The I think there are more options now than there were. There wasn't uh, a Lawyers for Human Rights. There wasn't uh, Southern California Women for Understanding, you mm -hmm. know, in the in the early 70s. There wasn't a Still place though, for people to go. But mm -hmm. Abby's point, really uh, saying there's somewhere for people to go, doesn't belie the fact that the women are choosing to go there. Lesbian mm -hmm. and gay mm -hmm. bar association right. rather than right. women lawyers. Mm -hmm. of and LA. why is that? Mm -hmm. I don't know. See, are they not? It's hard for me to say because I felt I wanted to do my work in feminism. That's where I wanted mm -hmm. to go. And there was never, I never felt anybody going, well, don't just don't tell anybody you're a lesbian. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think there, there's sort of these hierarchy of groups, too. Is like those groups that don't want to think that they're homophobic, right? And then there's groups that don't care if anybody thinks that they're homophobic or if they are homophobic. And so we have these layers. Mm -hmm. And I think that Women Lawyers of LA is one of those groups that wants to believe it is not homophobic. Whether or not it is in terms of its board or its membership is a question that really hasn't been pursued. Of course, you know, there's a critical well, mass question, too. Well, what if we had 15 lesbians on the Women Lawyers Board and eight straight women? There might begin to be a concern about the way women lawyers were viewed by all the major law firms. That's right. You know, this credibility the question issue. that you brought up. That's the same right. issue, and it was what you talked about earlier. Well, we don't have anyone on the board, so we don't have to worry about <laughs> diversity, right? I heard this yesterday but, from I mean, college president. But we do president. that on, mm -hmm. on any of the boards that we sit on now or in any of the groups that we're we're, we're trying, those of us who, who are have a consciousness are trying to reach out. So I guess it's maybe not what Abby is saying, that they went to other groups. I could say that, you know, there, there are no African Americans on this board. Why? Because they belong to the NAACP? I mean, mm -hmm. it, th that, that's not an answer for why there are no lesbians yeah. on that, you know, on that board. Um, or, or in any other, in any other. Maybe group. it's just more subtle. Maybe instead of saying "Don't come out because everybody's going to hate us because we got too many dykes in this group," they're not saying it. But maybe we still you know, feel ourselves. You know? Well, let me let me ask this question, which may be an unpopular question. Earlier, Jenny had said that perhaps there were issues that the lesbian community within the women's movement felt differently or, or saw as different set of priorities from what straight women within the movement may have thought, mm -hmm. and if straight women are perhaps reacting to that. Now we're reacting to the idea that that's not our agenda. You guys have an agenda where we have a shared agenda. Yeah, let's go do it together. Where we don't, we don't want this. Now, I don't know if that's a part of this or not, but- But that the, would mean the, there's I, a straight women's movement. That's right. Yeah. And I don't know that that isn't true. I, I don't- And there, there are also, I mean, look at some of the issues. Look at the issue of choice. It took mm -hmm. a long time to really make, as far as I'm concerned, the gay and lesbian movement understand that choice was as important to the gay and lesbian movement mm -hmm. as it was to women, mm -hmm. as it was right. to straight women. That it's a body it's, sovereignty issue. Yes, it's mm -hmm. about, it's about, you know, control of your body. It took a long time for lesbians to believe and understand that there was violence by lesbians against lesbians. Mm -hmm. And it's only recently that the, 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 the battered women's movement has been doing any kind of consciousness raising or any work mm -hmm. uh, with, with lesbian battering. And, mm -hmm. you know, so I mean, the issues are, are more complex, I think, than right. we can't fit them all into little boxes. Right. You know, I hate to stop this, but we only had a half an hour and it went really <laughs> fast. So I want to thank all three of you very much and hope yeah. that we'll go on for years and years and years and you'll be back on the show and, uh, <laughs> I know I'm going to see you at dinner anyway. It doesn't matter. Thank you for joining us. This was Get Used to It, and we hope that you'll uh, tune in and watch us again. Good night.